We are live and welcome everybody to our vaccination conversation 2.0. Uh, thank you for all of you who are in the chat. I see you uh, here and thank you for spending a portion of your evening uh, with us as you're preparing for what's going to be a very strong week uh, for you. Uh, we wanted to today follow up on our conversation that we had on this past Wednesday, which was uh, amazing. It was very informative. Uh, I thought we hit a level of depth that I didn't uh, anticipate as we planned this out, uh, but it was very, very rewarding. And so many of you were engaged and were informed and we received some awesome feedback. However, there were a lot of questions that we did not get an opportunity uh, to answer. And we did want each and every one of you to know that we really, really, uh, appreciate your engagement and we appreciate um, the questions that you raise. And so we wanted to take tonight just an informal time for us to come uh, and to share uh, any questions that uh, you may have. And so uh, thank God for all of you. Listen, before I uh, bring our doctors on, I want you to like, tag, and share. Can you do that for me? Like, tag, and share. And this was an awesome time for us to do this. There's no sports on TV right now. Uh, I was about to pass out, you know, just uh, just just waiting till 830 come. I'm getting a little older now. And without any football stimulation or basketball going on, uh, you know, it, it was a little bit boring around the house. So today may have been a great day for us uh, to do this. And so um, go ahead and like, tag, and share, and then we're going to jump right in. Uh, we have our resident doctors uh, who are part of our church. And uh, let me just say, I just appreciate God sending us uh, great people who have very unique callings. These are sharp individuals who are part, not just of our church, but a part of the kingdom and a part of, of course, our uh, North Shore community. And we appreciate them being a part uh, of this conversation tonight. Of course, uh, this lady needs no introduction. She is a staple in our church <clears throat> and uh, she is leading uh, very effectively our health and healing ministry uh, now and doing a phenomenal job helping us to chart our course through this pandemic to keep all of our partners informed of how we can stay healthy for those who have received uh, positive uh, designations, how they can uh, uh, safely return to health. Uh, and so I thank and bless God for her. Put a clap hand emoji in the comments for Dr. Leanne Fowler, uh, who is with us tonight after working in the hospital all day. <laughs> we appreciate you so much, Leanne for uh, giving us uh, this time on tonight uh, to kind of answer some questions. Glad uh, to be here. Also, yeah, we also have uh, everybody's ENT, uh, Dr. Tony Dennis, uh, who is sharing with us uh, on uh, tonight. And of course he practices right here in the Hammond um, community at North Oaks Hospital. Uh, he's also uh, very involved with our men's ministry uh, keeping our men up to date on how we can live healthy lives as well. I want you to put a clap hand emoji in the comments for the champ that's on with us tonight, as uh, Deacon Tyrone would say, uh, Dr. Tony Dennis. Tony, thank you so much for sharing with us tonight. <clears throat> thank you for inviting us, man. Really appreciate yeah. it. So we want to uh, we want to get right in. And for those of you who have questions, I want you all to just engage uh, in the conversation as well. I'll put my phone up here so I could catch some of this. We are... Um, just kind of laid back tonight. Uh, it's not as formal as it was on Wednesday, uh, but we do want to make some progress as it relates to getting positive uh, information out there concerning uh, the decision that all of us have to make around vaccination, okay? So you guys can go ahead and put some comments in the, uh, in the chat and I'll pick up with some of the comments that, uh, that, we, that we had or some of the questions that we had in the comments from Wednesday night. Uh, first of all, let me just thank publicly, I want to do this again, thank Leanne for all of her uh, leadership towards putting this together. Uh, she came to me and said, Bishop, this would be a, a phenomenal idea to make sure that our uh, church is informed, that our community has the facts that they need to make a healthy decision. And Leanne, I want to just publicly thank you so, so much uh, for your leadership there. All right, so uh, I'm going to get you guys thoughts first before we jump into uh, the questions on what did you guys think about Wednesday night? Uh, Leanne, I'll start with you. Oh, I was so pleased with the way everything turned out. I feel like the speakers were excellent, spoke clearly, um, 
uh, I'm just so thankful that you extended your platform uh, for it for that reason. I think it went very well. I was hoping, I'm so glad you were able to, to do this, that we could answer everybody's questions. Um, so this will allow us to that opportunity. Absolutely, absolutely. Dr. Daniels, what were your thoughts? I 100% agree. It, it was great to be in, in a, on, a, on a panel with such fine uh, physicians and, and researchers, epidemiologists. Um, it was awesome. And, and I think the only knock was we didn't get to answer questions. And this is what this forum is made for. So I'm excited about uh, this, this talk part two. Yeah, that's, that was one of the things that I was very proud of is that, man, we almost had the who's who uh, in the medical industry in Louisiana uh, on with us, the Beacon Light Church of Hammond, uh, on this past Wednesday. Of course, uh, Dr. Keith Ferdinand, uh, he was one of my customers when I was working in corporate America and uh, just a staple in the Ninth War uh, and has just worked tirelessly to champion uh, uh, health there in, uh, in the African-American community in New Orleans. And so it was uh, great to see him. And then uh, the other two sisters that uh, Dr. Brown uh, uh, sharing with us as well. It was just it was just phenomenal. So let's let's jump right in. Uh, the first question, and we had a lot of questions like this, and I want us to just reiterate uh, this one. Uh, and that is uh, people who are making a decision to take the vaccine, and they may have some underlying conditions, uh, cardio conditions, uh, uh, bronchitis with some of the other uh, questions that was there. Are there any conditions that an individual have that they may need to be concerned with taking the vaccine? I'll shoot this one to you, Dr. Dennis. Um, so when we talk about comorbidities such as cardiovascular disease, hypertension, uh, particularly obesity um, and, and, and lung disease, I wholeheartedly endorse the vaccination for those patients because when you look at the risk uh, of what the virus is, is doing to those patients, uh, it's certainly uh, uh, the, the benefits outweigh the risk of the vaccination. So those patients uh, who have comorbidities sometimes do poorly um, tolerating coronavirus, as opposed to a healthy individual who we, we know are, are, are doing fairly well, still risky, but it's doing uh, much better than those with comorbidities. The one area I would ask the, uh, the person to speak with their personal healthcare provider is pregnancy. Um, it, it wasn't heavenly studied well in pregnancy. I know a few people who were pregnant or got pregnant during uh, the first shot and the second shot. Um, I think that's a, a little bit more hairy. And I, I think that's a conversation you should have uh, with your OBGYN as opposed to using this forum for that question. So that's the one area I, I would tell you to uh, talk to your healthcare provider, but the others um, I wholeheartedly endorse the vaccination for. Yep. Dr. Fowler? Nothing different. Um, absolutely. The risk of getting the illness is far greater than the risk that we've seen so far in getting the vaccine. Um, unless you have had prior uh, allergic or anaphylactic reactions to the vaccine, then I, I would, you know, ask them to speak more with their personal um, physician or, or MP or whoever um, their, their personal provider is. The reason for that is twofold. Number one, are they equipped with an EpiPen? Do they have a history of severe allergies, um, things like that? And someone that is familiar with your care uh, is better equipped to, to give that advice. Um, furthermore, they may also have a place where they can stay and get the vaccine and be monitored for a longer period of time. So that, you know, if they're gonna have a, an anaphylactic reaction, it will often be right after you've given, been given the medication. You can get a delayed reaction, but it's usually not severe. As severe, it can be, but not usually. Um, so that's the only situation. Even our immunocompromised, you know, I take care of several immunocompromised patients, and they are at high risk. So even when your immune system um, does not function the way um, someone who does not have a chronic disease like lupus or rheumatoid arthritis or um, uh, HIV or anything. They, they are at, this is not a live virus. It's not a live vaccine. So they should be immunized. Okay. Uh, along those same lines, one of the other questions that uh, I saw and uh, Dr. Fowler, I'll shoot this one to you. And that is about vaccinations for frontline workers. And this was the question specifically. It said uh, a lot of African-American frontline workers are infecting elderly people. What is the process of 
frontline workers getting vaccinated. And I assume that they were asking, are they uh, being made to be vaccinated to work uh, in the hospital setting? Is it, you know, do they get an option to do so? Can you kind of talk to that? Yeah, right now it's optional to my knowledge. It's not uh, mandatory. I do suspect that it, it may become mandatory. I also suspect that it, I, I wonder if that question is coming from nursing homes. We did see where nursing home residents were infected because staff moving, you know, cross contaminating and moving from one facility to another if they work in different places. Um, now there's no strong data on that. Those are theories. Um, so I'm not sure where that where that question, um, what what the intent is for that question, but it's highly encouraged. And of the 300 and something thousand people who have already been vaccinated, the, the majority of them are frontline workers. OK, um, uh, I just saw somebody put in the chat and it's kind of right on what we're talking about. Uh, chemo meds, Dr. Dennis, uh, if you're. Uh, receiving cancer treatment, chemo, is there any hesitancy about receiving the vaccination there? So that's that's a good one. Um, I, I think if you're getting, because there's all sorts of uh, chemo meds, there are some immunomodulators um, and others, or immunomodulators like antibodies uh, going after uh, different target molecules. Um, and then there's your, your traditional chemo. I, I think that's a really touchy one that you should ask your, your uh, medical oncologist about. Um, because that's that's a little bit outside of the scope of the studies. When you look at the studies, they had hypertensive patients, they had obesity, they had COPD patients, they had African Americans, they had uh, Latino patients. But I'm almost sure I didn't read anything about uh, cancer patients uh, that's actively receiving chemotherapy. So when you start going into that area of medicine, that's so specific yeah. that uh, I, I I I tell you, ask your 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 uh, medical oncologist. That that's a deeper one. Uh, how you, you have anything to contribute to that? I one hundred percent concur. Not every chemo med, quote unquote, is equal. Um, so that the person who's prescribing that medication should be the the person giving that advice. Yes, uh, and that question came from uh, Cassandra from the comment line. So thank you, Cassandra, for uh, your engagement. All right, let's shift gears uh, for just a moment. Uh, I want to talk about the skepticism for just a moment because that's something we touched on on Wednesday, uh, specifically with African Americans and how uh, this disease state has affected African Americans in particular. Um, as Dr. Ferdinand so eloquently put on Wednesday, that you know our skepticism is not unfounded. Uh, like we really have, uh, you know, a history of that. And I thought he did a great job explaining uh, what the difference was during the Tuskegee experiment and uh, this vaccination plan that we're in uh, right now. Is there any um, data or research or literature out there that's saying that the vaccination uh, is going to affect African Americans any differently than uh, the rest of the population? I'll start no. with Dr. Fowler. <laughs> <laughs> no, there, there's no, uh, it will affect us differently if we don't get vaccinated. I mean, yeah. the, the being infected has already shown a, a tremendous disparity among our communities, but I have not seen anything. Have you, Dr. Dennis? No, I haven't. I want to see, can I share my screen? Uh, this is something I had for, for the last talk. We just didn't get to it, but let me see, can I show this? Um, this is data. Can you guys see that? This is data from the uh, from the two trials. And of course, there's the Johnson & Johnson trial now. Um, but this is the Pfizer group. This is Moderna. You'll see that there was almost 10% African Americans uh, in, in these studies. Now, that's under the, the general population where we're representing 12 to 13% in America now. This is 16 plus. Uh, so those who are eligible for the study and eligible for the vaccination. So there were African Americans in both studies and, and we didn't see any different in adverse uh, uh, effects. So that, that goes to show you it's just as safe in, in, in African Americans as it is in any other group. And I even think uh, we had 26% um, Latina or Hispanic in the Pfizer study and Moderna had 20%. So plus you know that it's, it's, it, it was studied in different populations and it was safe um, so from, from that data, just drawing conclusions from that data, it, it appears to be very effective and, and still very safe in the African-American population. 
Yeah, I read a report on today that said um, 22 million Americans, I believe now, have been uh, vaccinated. My numbers may be off, but the CDC was reporting that the adverse events uh, is correlating perfectly with what the studies uh, had seen when they when they studied in their patient population as well. So it doesn't really seem like, and I know if you've been on social media, I don't know if you guys have had time to, to look at that, you always have people, oh, this person died, you know, two days after taking the injection, or this person got seriously ill, et cetera. Um, and a lot of times we don't even know if those things are even uh, related or not, but that's some of the information out there that I believe is giving some folks in our community pause about uh, the vaccine. Uh, I, I want to to ask you guys that, you know, outside of uh, injection site infections, uh, 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 adverse events, are there any other uh, things that individuals need to worry about if they receive the vaccine uh, and something, you know, off kilter is happening? This is something that they need to be aware of. I'll start with you, Dr. Fowler. Is there anything that they should be concerned about. The, big, the biggest thing is um, allergic reaction. And if they have a delayed hypersensitivity reaction, that would be it. There is a, an app. The CDC has an app where if you've been vaccinated, and I will, I will find the name of that app. I want to say it, it's be safe, but don't, don't trust me right now. Um, I'll, I'll find the name of it. But there's an app. If there, if there are severe reactions, they want to know about it. And to date, to date, what's been reported two days ago, today is Sunday, so Friday, what's been reported two days ago, there have not been serious adverse reactions that have been reported to date. Um, there have been uh, like cellulitis of the tissue where there was a local reaction here uh, and it became infected in that person, one person that I'm aware of where that skin became infected. I don't know if that's because of the vaccine, frankly, I, you know, that, that, that happens to us all without getting a needle stuck in the arm. Um, but other than that, allergic reaction. Okay, uh, here's another question. Like from, uh, go ahead, uh, Dr. Dennis. Let me, let me touch on that just one second. So, you know, the Moderna and the Pfizer study are the two longer studies and they've been rolling patients since March of 2020. So. It, it's about 10 months of data. And they've been following these patients. Also, the, although the data was reported in November and, and they talked about complications at that point, those patients are continually being followed. So we still don't know, I'm sorry, we still haven't reported anything bad happened in the long term. And in, in this particular conversation, long term is 10 months. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and remember the vehicle of the vaccination. So in the short term, we kind of know about that. We've studied that for 10 months. And when you think about the long-term consequences of the vaccine, I know there's a lot of people who have hesitancy about the vaccination, thinking about what may happen five years from now, what may happen 10 years from now. And those are real concerns. However, remember how delicate uh, the virus is. This is an mRNA vaccine. So the protein that's injected into your body is so delicate that you got to store it at all of these different temperatures, like negative I don't know, negative 94 and being careful how you thought, your body degrades the actual script or, or the message. Um, so, so I'm not terribly worried about long-term consequences because your body actually gets rid of the vaccine after the message is read. So right. that's kind of that's important to remember when you're thinking about what might happen to me next year or two years from now, your body actually got rid of uh, the message. Okay. Uh, also from Lisa in the comments, uh, can someone uh, who is vaccinated still contract? And there was another question that said, can someone who is vaccinated still spread? Uh, we'll let you pick that one up, Dr. Dennis. Uh, the answer is, the long answer is we don't know. The short answer is we don't know, but I, I suspect yes. Um, you still can get the virus if you're vaccinated. Um, the, the studies and every, the whole intent of vaccination is to stop you from getting sick. Uh, stop in hospitalization, stop in deaths. Um, however, the, the patients or the people enrolled into this study, they did not test to see if they had uh, asymptomatic uh, disease. So we don't know if you can still contract the virus. And I would go out on a limb and say, if you can contract the virus, then yes, you can spread the virus. 
So, so the first step is figuring out, can you contract? And that's very difficult to do. That means those people have to be tested over and over and over and over in the study. And I think that's a, that's a lot to ask for somebody to get tested uh, over and over and over again. So um, I, I think we should behave like you can still get infected with coronavirus, even with the vaccination, and you still can spread the virus. And hence why we should wear masks, continue to wash our hands, and continue to social distance. Uh, until it's a little bit safer. Um, the idea behind vaccination is to prevent uh, disease and prevent uh, symptomatic disease and prevent illnesses and uh, ultimately prevent deaths. Yeah, I think it's important to um, understand that when a clinical trial is started, they have certain questions that they wanna ask. Um, when any research is started, there's a question that's asked. So the question that they wanted answered by the clinical trials was, will we prevent illness? Will we prevent severe illness? The question, um, there might've been secondary questions asked. Um, I know the Moderna vaccine had some secondary questions asked, can we still pre uh, transmit infection? But the primary question was the primary priority, can we prevent illness? So the question has been answered with the, with the data to date so well that we are rolling it out to everyone um, so that we can try to cut down on severe illness. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Uh, go ahead, for you guys who are uh, connected with us tonight, go ahead and put your questions in the chat. We are monitoring uh, the chat. So you can go ahead and do that at this time. We're kind of going through some older questions that we received on Wednesday that we, that we were not able uh, uh, to, to get through to get to. Uh, another question we had, I think that can follow up on the one that you guys just uh, answered, is uh, if you had the virus, should you still get vaccinated? I think we kind of touched on that a little bit on Wednesday, but I wanted to, uh, to take that particular question because the person was like, what's the point in, um, in getting vaccinated if I've had it and recovered? That's a great question. Uh, I, I, the answer is yes, you should still get vaccinated. The more difficult question is when. Um, after infection, we believe, we don't know, believe you're protected for about three months. Um, and we don't know much past that. There's been several individuals have been infected with coronavirus more than once. Um, and generally they're looking at the three to four month period where there's, you know, just in a community with community spread, they're getting infected again. Um, we haven't had the vaccinations out long enough to say the same about the vaccinations. However, the thought process is that the immune response that you develop with the vaccination is so much uh, better than the immune response that you get from actual disease process, you should still get vaccinated. Um, and, and we're encouraging folks to get vaccinated even after uh, recovering from coronavirus later because of the shortage. Um, right now, there's a shortage of vaccination. And if you recently recovered from coronavirus, you probably are protected for the next two to three months. Um, and, and maybe you should stand in line and, and, and kind of let those who, have, who, who are uh, naive to the virus uh, go ahead and get vaccinated first. Okay. Um, this is another one we were talking about just before we got started. And I think that this is uh, so necessary. Why are some symptoms uh, in patients more severe than others, uh, because we know, you know, a healthy, I think Dr. Ferdinand referenced a healthy congressman up in North Louisiana, uh, young, uh, he, he died of uh, complications of COVID, and you have other people who are asymptomatic, don't even know that they had it if they didn't go get tested. So can we kind of talk about the severity of the symptoms and, and what, we're, what you guys are seeing in clinical practice of why there may be a spectrum there? Yeah. So there's two things I want to say to that. The first thing that we see, uh, we saw a lot, particularly in the, in the first few months of the pandemic, is we are, we have a very dense population in New Orleans, and we have multi-generational homes. So it's very difficult for if someone is positive to quarantine. There may not be a place to quarantine. So we would see the entire household, you know, get sick. Well, the other thing we saw was although the, the entire household to varying degrees became ill or sick, we also saw them get reinfected. Um, so you would see 
persons who would come in, let's say, April, and then you would see them again, and then a lot of their family members, and you would look through the chart, and you, and you would see a, a pattern. Um, so that has happened on multiple occasions when we talk about getting natural immunity, which segues me into the, to answer your question, um, which I cannot remember completely what your question was. Can you state it again? <laughs> Why are some symptoms more severe than others? Oh, okay. So which segues into to that question is In your moment. <laughs> it, de <laughs> it depends. It depends when it depends how much of the virus that you actually get. Um, that's what we call in, in healthcare viral load. It's how much of the virus, how much of the germ you actually get. So let's say um, my daughter coughed on me and she was positive for the infection, but she was asymptomatic. And she is coughing and coughing. And if you know anything about me and my children, we're pretty close in proximity and in relationship. Uh, so, you know, she's coughing in my face, coughing in my face, kissing me, coughing, coughing. Well, if she continues to do that, although she may be asymptomatic, the concentration of, of the virus, um, my concentration might be greater. Then you couple that in with my personal physiology. If my personal physiology, if my immune system uh, cannot fight like, like maybe her immune system can fight, then the virus takes, uh, takes advantage of that and it, and it starts to replicate um, and, it, and it starts to grow and that viral, that viral load continues and that concentration gets greater. So what we think is that those who have a greater viral load are those who get the most sick. Um, therefore, it's, it's clear, you, you can deduce that those who don't get symptomatic may not have had that much of the virus. So how much immunity will they have versus someone who became really sick? And that's where we know we can get you immune, 95%, 94, 95% with a vaccine. We don't know how immune you will be if you have that spectrum of illness. Dr. Dennis, anything to add there? No, I 100% I agree uh, with Dr. Fowler on that one. Um, and then there are some inherent differences uh, among different populations of people. Um, and, and, and there's a thought process that African Americans may have higher uh, ACE receptors uh, than our counterparts. And, and, and that is important because that is exactly uh, how the uh, virus likes to bind to different cells by using this molecule. And if you just happen to have more than the next person, there's more opportunity for the virus to enter your cells. Um, and now that's, that's in, in studies. Uh, that's in a test tube. That's something that's still in workings, um, but that, that's a theory that's out there as well. Right. Uh, you explained that to me a few weeks ago, and uh, I was the smartest person in my family's group chat uh, after that, after that uh, conversation that we had, uh, because that was a question someone had, uh, Sister Cherie had, about the spike protein is different in Blacks than whites. Uh, another question as it relates to different types is blood types. Does certain blood types uh, fare better than others? Dr. Dennis. So... I can't say if certain ones do better than others, but what we've seen in B positive, um, for some reason, man, we had a really bad run uh, with patients with B positive blood and particularly the, the treatment options where we were given uh, covalescent plasma. And, and what that is, is that's uh, blood products from other people with the same blood type that has things in there or nutrients in their uh, in their bodies that has already beat coronavirus. So they have the antibodies. And, and, and what we were doing was we're, we're using that as a treatment strategy for our patients. And uh, for some reason, be positive. Uh, I'm very, very, very uh, leery about using that in, in that population of people because they were, they were doing uh, not as well as uh, people with other blood types. That's what I've noticed. And, and I've seen some studies that kind of echo the same, but there's no real reason uh, uh, why that is true. Maybe Dr. Fowler. No, I, I, I don't know anything about the, the 
the ABO blood types and, and the impact it, it has versus um, one, particularly with convalescent plasma. We didn't use it as much at where, where I work, um, but yeah, I, I think that we'll learn more and more as we continue. That, that is that is hundred percent correct, and that was early on. Um, we're still using it. In fact, I, I used it just today, um, and, and be positive because that was the best treatment option for that patient. And I just had to have that conversation with them, and, and letting them know I, I still think this is the right thing to do. And, and we went ahead and proceeded with that that treatment strategy. Okay, another question from Kim in the comments: uh, How fast does the vaccine take effect to provide protection from COVID nineteen? I'll take that one. Yeah, Dr. Dennis has a great slide. Are you going to pull it up? Let's see. Can I pull up? You know, I wanted to say that on Wednesday night, but we was in a formal setting. My man got slides, y'all. He got <laughs> data. All right. Don't play with him. All right. right bro. Ready, ready for all the smoke. Go ahead. Man. ahead. Let's see. Now I got to learn how to share my slide. <laughs> Let's see. Okay. Can you guys see my slide? Uh, not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Did you hit the green share button? Uh, here it is. There we go. Here we go. All right, we cook it. Y'all see your slides. Right. So this is keep on this slides. Hey, hey, bro, I gotta put on my slides, man. Easy to uh, explain this stuff with pictures, man. Pictures are worth thousands of words. So here's a study that looked at. So the, the question is, when should I expect um, protection after uh, vaccination? And then. This is taken directly from the Pfizer uh, study in New England Journal of Medicine. So here's, you know, let me explain what this is. This, this is time point zero. And this yellow graph shows you those who are in the placebo arm of the study. And this gray bar are those who are in the uh, vaccinated arm of the study. So at time zero is gonna be the exact same, whether or not you got the vaccination or not, uh, your rate of getting infected is the same. And that's true for week one. But then you start to see a small difference at about week two. That's uh, about 14 days out. And you can see that difference continues to grow as you're getting closer to week three. Um, and you also notice that this is a linear, you know, you know, linear rise from those in the placebo effect. But you'll see that after two weeks, you're starting to taper off with the Pfizer uh, vaccination. And the Moderna one looks almost identical. Um, so the textbook answer is gonna be three weeks, three to four weeks, because this is when you're starting to see statistical significant data. But you can start to feel good at about that two to three week point, but the, the textbook answer is gonna be uh, three weeks because you're seeing a, a larger gap. This is the gap you wanna see. So when individuals uh, who have completed their vaccination process, is it uh, safe for them to kind of start venturing out as uh, like some of our elderly population? I know we have uh, some of our elderly who have received both of their doses. At what point in time would it be, for example, good for them to come back to church or something like that? I think it's safe for them to come back to church, but I will still maintain that social distance and, and maintain that mask. Mm -hmm. um, remember, it, the, the vaccination, the, the, the arms of vaccinations, I'm sorry, the studies did not ask whether or not you can get infected. And remember, it's 94% and 95% effective, not 100% effective. So mm -hmm. you certainly don't want to get the vaccination and have this just kind of false sense of security and, and think you're invincible. And then you fall into that 6% who, who are, the vaccination wasn't effective for you. So I, I think that you should have some, you should feel good that you're vaccinated, but continue to do the same things you were doing uh, up until the date of vaccination. I don't, I don't think you should change your behavior. Uh, the community uh, spread numbers are way too high uh, yeah. to take that chance. Yeah, and that's what I was gonna say. I would say that um, pay attention to what's in the community when, when because the, the virus spreads so easily when the transmission rate is really, really high, then you're, you have, you're taking more risk than when the transmission rate is lower. You're taking you know, less risk. So I, I think you have to choose your risks carefully, um, particularly those who are more vulnerable. 
Um, you have to do something. You have to get out and, and do something that speaks to your spirit and your soul, um, you know, and socialize and not be isolated. And, and But you have to measure your risk carefully. Right. Um, and, and I want you to kind of talk a little bit more to that. I was reading the other night um, something around uh, children and them not being able to go back to school and how suicide is up uh, with our teens, et cetera. Uh, let's just kind of talk about the necessity of uh, not operating in fear. Like you're saying, choose what you're going to do. It's going to be important for you, especially if you're elderly and you've been shut in for a year. It, it's psychologically, I would think that it would be healthy for them to find some activity that they can begin to to do to kind of bring some normalcy. Can you speak to that? Yeah, well, I, I think that um, we have to know that social gatherings are big spreading events. We, we have lots of data on that for the last few months. Um, so if at all, it would be great if it could be outside. If it isn't outside, um, then it needs to be in a place where it, a lot of mitigation measures are in place. Listen, I have been in basketball gyms um, with my children and you go in one parish and, and it's like you, you have to sit on the sticker. You go in another parish and you can sit wherever you want and people you don't know can come sit right next to you, um, you know, which makes me a little leery, um, you know, taking that risk when the transmission rate is really high. Um, so I, I think that you, that you have to do something. You're right, you have to bring some normalcy, but it has to be done with great care and great awareness uh, of what is going on in the community. And it changes, you know, week to week, at least we gather data week to week. And now we have a variant and the variant spreads a little faster. Um, thankfully, we have a vaccine, you know, so I, I wouldn't say be afraid. I would say be aware and be be conscious and, and don't just take for granted and have some respect just for, you know, the illness and the germ that's out there. It is what this, this is the time where we have. I think what is um, enlightening for me particularly as a college uh, teacher, is the level of uh, coping skills. I, I was very, very taken aback by how few coping skills our kids have now. And, and that's something we, you know, that this has brought out. So yes, we have to do something, but yes, we also have to be, you know, develop some mental toughness and do what is is best um, at the moment because it's out of our control right now. Um, you know, we just have to make the best decision. Right. I, I want to speed this along. So we have a question from the uh, the comment section from Jamie. Uh, should antibody tests be done before or after uh, vaccination? Uh, we kind of talked about antibodies a little bit off camera as well. Can you kind of talk about uh, antibodies? I'll push this one to you, Dr. Dennis. Sure. Uh, so the antibody test that we have available now um, gives you a yes or no answer. Uh, it, it's just a qualitative yeah or no, um, but it doesn't tell you how much protection. So you can, let's say you were infected with coronavirus in December and, and, and now you come around uh, later this year, later this month, it's, it's six to eight weeks later and, and you say, okay, I'm thinking about getting a vaccination, but I won't get it if I, if, I, if I have antibodies. And you go get an antibody test. And sure enough, you got antibodies. Just because you have antibodies, that doesn't necessarily tell you that you have enough antibodies for protection. Um, so it's a, it's a yes or no answer. And you say, yes, I got it. But are you protected? You don't know. Um, and that's certainly different from the vaccine. Um, what we believe from the vaccine data is that that protection is longer and a bit stronger. Uh, and that's why Dr. Ferdinand even touched on uh, most people are thinking that this is going to last a year. Um, now, will, will you have to get a booster in a year, kind of like the flu? That has yet to be determined. We don't know that yet. But, but we're looking at immunity uh, for, for six to, to, to 12 months with the vaccination uh, as opposed to uh, the natural immunity where it's, it's likely closer to three months or under. Gotcha. Uh, another question that came from Tamara on Wednesday, 
Is there any correlation between the COVID vaccine, like the flu vaccine, between COVID vaccine and GB? And you can explain what GB is. <laughs> <laughs> so my man, uh, Dennis has issues with GB. GB is Guillain Barre. Uh, <laughs> That's what I was gonna say. Guillain Barre. Oh yeah, oh yeah. So Guillain Barre syndrome. Also known as muscular. Bar. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. Uh, so it, it's something that that is one of the complications that we know about from uh, the flu vaccine. Um, and, and some folks, for we don't know why, um, after the flu vaccination, they develop um, ascending paralysis. Um, and that can be devastating. Uh, most people get it back, but some people don't get uh, full function uh, of, of their legs or even uh, the diaphragm where they're, you know, dependent on machines and whatnot for breathing. So Guillain-Barre is a serious complication. Uh, it's very rare and it's been seen um, from, from flu vaccination. Um, that same thing has not been seen with uh, either COVID vaccines. Um, and, and you know, there's another one, Johnson & Johnson uh, produced their data and, and the same holds true in, in that uh, third um, option we have with, with Johnson & Johnson. We have not seen Guillain-Barre in any of these yet. And um, they were looking for it because the, the experience with the, when, when we had the flu epidemic in however many years ago, because of that complication, they were looking for it. So they, they wanted to see if, if that would happen. It's a different mechanism in which this vaccine works. They're different uh, products in the medication. Um, so it's very different. And I think that it should also be noticed that you can develop Guillain-Barre from a virus itself. You can develop Guillain-Barre from taking certain medications. You can develop. Um, so it's not unique to the flu vaccine. Um, it's just one of those neuromuscular disorders that, that came up that we saw um, with the flu vaccine years ago. Right. We're about to end in just a moment. I need everybody who is watching us now, like and share this right now. Uh, several of you have been tagging folks, and I thank you so much for that. There are going to be a lot of people who were not with us live, uh, and they are going to come back and watch this tonight. They're going to have a bout of insomnia, and they're not going to be able to sleep, and they can watch this and get some good information. So do that right now. If you don't like this and you're watching this, I pray that the elastic gives way in your pants on tomorrow. Night. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just playing, but go ahead and like uh, and share this because this is the type of information that we need to be flooding social media with some facts, uh, some figures, uh, some graphs as my man brought his graphs uh, with us today and we could do that. Let's shift as we close out, let's shift and talk about uh, the vaccines that are in the pipeline and what we know about them. There was one question from Lamar asking, can you explain the Johnson & Johnson vaccine? We know that the uh, delivery technology is a little different in that one. And how can you contrast that with the uh, Pfizer and Moderna? Man, I had that ready for Wednesday. Let me go back to my slides, baby. Oh, my man got slides. <laughs> man, don't sleep on my slides. Let's see here. So you guys, oh, there, there it is right there. So just, just briefly, this is a, a picture of when I was de describing uh, this squiggly line represents mRNA. Um, and this is the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccination uses this technology where uh, you have a message at RNA within a capsid because this is the way you can get it into the cell. It goes into your cell. The message makes a protein. The protein is now on the outside of the cell. And this is what our body recognizes in order for us to gain immunity and protection. So I'm gonna cut through a couple slides. Now, how does that differ from Johnson & Johnson? Johnson & Johnson and also uh, AstraZeneca, uh, they're using a little bit more tried and true uh, ways to use uh, to deliver their message into the cell. So they're using adenovirus. Adenovirus is a is a is a virus that is is wait let me tell you this, it's a virus that causes URI. However, this is attenuated. So and that simply means weakened or killed virus. So you should not get um, sick with just getting adenovirus uh, or getting this vaccine. I just want to make sure we, we we say that clearly. So. Unlike uh, Pfizer and Moderna, where they're using RNA, which is very uh, fragile, it has to be stored at very cold temperatures. 
uh, uh, AstraZeneca and also Johnson & Johnson, they're using, you can see two squiggly lines as opposed to right here, I was showing you one squiggly line. So this is two squiggly lines and that's DNA. Okay, so it's a whole lot more stable. Some of the advantages are um, it's easy to distribute this virus. Um, you can store it uh, like six months uh, in just in a refrigerator. And because it's a single shot, um, hopefully that may increase compliance as opposed to two shots where on a second shot, you may not be able to make it to the, the site. And it's, it's very time sensitive. So Pfizer wants you to do it in 21 days. Moderna says, hey, come back in 28 days. And, and if you're outside of that window, uh, you may have some issues. Uh, with the Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca, it's a single injection. Um, so the science is a little bit different. Here's the double lines, the, the DNA. It's within adenovirus. The adenovirus has spike proteins itself. Um, and that is the way it enters your cell. So once the adenovirus enters the cell, your body kind of gobbles it up. And as it's making its way to the nucleus, this is where the DNA from the DNA, you, you, you know, the vaccine itself is injected into the nucleus of the cell. And it uses your own body mechanics to make messenger RNA. And then that messenger RNA is kind of like the same thing we talked about back here, where that message RNA makes a spike protein. So it's a little bit longer route. However, this is the way uh, folks were looking at many different vaccinations um, before messenger RNA was, was uh, more readily available. So it's, it's a little bit older technology. However, it's, it's tried and true. Um, and Johnson & Johnson came out with their study, I wanna say on the 29th and, and said that it's 66% uh, effective uh, overall and 85% uh, effective as far as preventing severe disease. And, and I know what's gonna happen. We're gonna want to compare the 93 and 94 and 95 uh, percent effective rates of uh, the two mRNA vaccination versus the 66 percent effective rate of Johnson and Johnson, and it's going to sound like nobody wants to get Johnson and Johnson, because why get 66 when you can get 94? Uh, remember, anything over 50 percent would have been accepted. So if that wasn't a Pfizer or it wasn't a Moderna, if you were shooting 50 percent and saying that hey, this can decrease your risk of severe disease by 50 percent, we still get in that line. Um, so I don't want us to get too spoiled by the high, uh, high rates that Pfizer and Moderna are, are, are projecting. However, if I had my choice, of course, I, I would choose a 93, 94, but that's because I had a choice. Um, remember, uh, the, vaccina uh, the vaccines are, you know, is a limited amount. So if you cannot get your hands on it, um, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't wait a year uh, waiting for, for the two that's 93, 94 and have something that's 66% effective overall and is 85% uh, effective against severe disease. And let me just quickly divide, define severe disease because that's just a blanket statement. In this study, severe disease was defined as people going to the hospital and then they tighter it up from there, ICU and also um, mechanical ventilation. So uh, it's, it's still safe and, and it's still effective, um, not as effective as the, the other two we spoke about. Right. Uh, Dr. Fowler, um, go ahead. Yeah. So to piggyback on that, I think it's important to understand that there may be a time where people who are very high risk will be the priority for the higher efficacy vaccine. Um, that has been done in the past, particularly with our older populations with flu vaccines, pneumonia vaccines, uh, zoster vaccine, you know, different types of, of vaccines. So, you know, what we want is more immunity, and that should be our priority. And the fact that we are getting it is a blessing. So regardless, if you are in that high risk um, high risk category. And if, if that's all we have available, that's probably more than many other countries around the world and we need to get it. Um, so that we have, to, we have to stay focused and not try to be too divisive with um, you know, what's available. Okay, um, Dr. Fowler, I know that you work closely with the um, 
um, Governor John Bell Edwards team on uh, COVID-19. Do you have any idea what the daily goal of vaccination is for the state? No, I don't have the, the daily goal. I don't even know if there is a daily goal, um, frankly, because of the distribution of vaccine. At this point, we want as many people vaccinated as possible, but I don't know if there's a hard number. I do know Dr. Ferdinand actually confirmed it on our, our call, um, is that we should be getting a new shipment and more frequently next week. So that means if, if we get a readily supply, a ready supply of, of vaccination, then it might be more reasonable to make a goal. Gotcha. Uh, final question for tonight. Uh, what's the process to actually get vaccinated? What do individuals have to do if they fall within the certain age range or risk factor range and they need to get vaccinated? There were some talks about pharmacies uh, giving the vaccination or even uh, uh, you know, pop-up places where people can drive up and get the vaccination through the National Guard. Can we kind of speak to that before we close out tonight? Yeah, so right now on the website for Louisiana Department of Health, ldh.gov, Louisiana Department of Health, there are distribution points, points of distribution or pods. Those that are open to persons who meet the criteria um, can go there. That's 70 and older. If they're in nursing homes, usually the pharmacy goes to them and not the nursing home resident goes to the pharmacy. Um, then they can meet, you know, if they have ID and their first, their first responders, then they can go there. Yes, it, it is true that they're thinking about, you know, distributing it in different ways, particularly through pharmacies, particularly through doctor's offices, um, hospitals, um, and other points of distribution. Our school of nursing is a point of distribution right now to the healthcare community and not to the community at large um, just yet but that'll probably change. Awesome. awesome. Now, folks is a, also a place of distribution and it's open to select patients. Um, so right now, if you're a patient already established in our system and meet all the other criteria, um, then you're able to get vaccinated. Um, and it's pretty strict. Um, yeah. they, they really strict, you know, stick to it because you, you don't want to get dinged by doing favors and not meeting criteria, and some people are showing favor in this and that and the other. But if you're meeting the criteria and, and you're also a patient of one of the providers at North Oaks, uh, there's a phone number you can call. And I share that number all the time with my patients. In fact, it's on a wall uh, right in my exam rooms where, you know, just in case we don't get to that topic, while you're waiting on me, it's this big old sign that say, hey, if you're interested, we can talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and again, the vaccination is not for everybody. Um, and and as, as I want to be very clear on that where, yes, I endorse the vaccine, but this is not a forum to tell everybody to go run out and get vaccinated because it's really not for absolutely everybody. But I, I think it's important to, uh, to understand your risk and understand your risk of not getting vaccine, uh, vaccinated versus uh, your potential risk if you choose to get vaccinated and just whatever makes your heart right and, and, and what you can tolerate. For instance, I, I couldn't tolerate just sitting in the house. Uh, I, I just like to get out and I like to coach ball and I like to go to church and I like to do a lot of stuff. I like to practice medicine. So when I thought about my risk, um, I, I'm always doing something. So uh, I, I chose to get vaccinated as opposed to one of my friends who's a farmer and he and I had a good conversation about this. He works by himself. It's only him and his wife. He doesn't go anywhere. He gets his food delivered to his house before a coronavirus. So when we had our discussion, I was like, well, maybe, maybe you do okay <laughs> not getting vaccinated because he's not interested in it. And he's like, you know, Tony, well, even when I go on vacation, I go to the mountains. Uh, I enjoy quietness and I enjoy just me and my wife. So uh, again, his risks are different from my risk. And, and, and I think that that's the things that we should all look at when we're trying to make the decision on, on whether, whether or not to get vaccinated. I think that's a great place to uh, to go ahead and shut down. Uh, and I think that was our whole, pur whole purpose, excuse me. And the purpose was, you know, we wanted to give you information so you can make a decision that's best for you and your family. Uh, to those who need to get vaccinated, uh, certainly we want you to have all the tools that you need 
uh, to do that. For those of you who choose not to, we want you to at least have enough information to make a decision to say, no, I don't want this. So uh, again, as we close out, can y'all help me, man? I am just peacock proud and hyena happy to have uh, these two individuals a part of our church. They are just phenomenal. And, uh, you know, these are the kind of great people you can be around if you come to our church at Beacon Light. You can be around people like Dr. Fowler and Dr. Dennis. But uh, we thank you guys so much for giving us uh, 45 Baptist minutes, uh, <laughs> you know, about 50 minutes, 55 minutes, uh, regular people time of, uh, of your Sunday evening uh, away from your family. And uh, as we say in the church, may the Lord bless you real, real good uh, for what it is that you sowed into the hearts uh, of so many people on tonight. If y'all don't mind, just for a second, as we close out, I want to pray. Uh, we often uh, repeat and say in our church that Jesus is our healer. And oftentimes healing manifests in various different ways. God has gifted some people with healing hands and healing minds. Uh, and I thank God for uh, Dr. Uh, Fowler and Dr. Tony. God has gifted them with healing hands and healing minds. And we appreciate them. I want to pray for them. I want to pray for everybody that's watching and even uh, for our world as we transition out of this, uh, of this pandemic. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you for tonight uh, where facts can be uh, disseminated. I thank you for every person that engaged. We thank you for uh, our two family members, Dr. Fowler and Dr. Dennis tonight, Lord God. Thank you for the unique anointing that you've given them for such a time as this, Lord God. And so I pray that as they would continue to uh, work and serve people, Lord God, that you would keep their bodies healthy, that you would keep their families protected, Lord God, and that you would keep your grace upon their life, Lord God. I thank you now for every person that's a part of our church. I thank you right now, Lord God, that you are protecting us. We speak now Psalm 91 over each and every one of our lives. And we even thank you for what you're doing even in the world, Lord God, as we're turning this corner, as we're coming out of this very, very dark day. And we're going to give you all of the glory and the honor and the praise for the gifted men and women that you have anointed to help lead us out of this very dark time. We love you, God. We thank you for this time tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank y'all so very, very much. We appreciate you uh, from the bottom of our hearts. Likewise, sir. Thank you.